The actress who got her start in the 1995 hit Clueless and rose to fame in Eight Mile died today. Los Angeles police are investigating the death of this 32-year-old actress, Brittany Murphy. What's the latest, David? Well, the latest is that the New York City Medical Examiner's Office today announced that they've concluded Heath Ledger died from an accidental overdose. And the overdose happened from six different prescription drugs, um, anti-anxiety, sleeping aid, as well as painkiller. And they're saying that the, really, that the acute intoxication was what killed him. And this happened when all these prescription pills were mixed together. The media circus surrounding the death of Anna Nicole Smith today included details of her autopsy. The troubled former Playboy centerfold leaves a wake of speculation, litigation, and fascination, all evident today in equal measure. No evidence has been revealed to suggest that a crime occurred. We found no illegal drugs. Only prescription medicine. Meanwhile, on national television this morning, Smith's mother suggested her daughter's death was similar to that of her 20-year-old son, Daniel, who died last fall. I think she had too many drugs. I, uh, just like Danny. Prescription drug abuse is an epidemic in the United States today. This epidemic has a target audience, America's youth. Young people have access to these drugs and are abusing them in alarming numbers. But this problem isn't about numbers, it's about real people. Real people like you, like JD. My name is JD, I'm 22 years old, I'm an addict and this is my story. What was your first experience with prescription drugs? Uh, when I was 16 years old, I uh, had a back injury due to uh, lacrosse and football, and uh, I was prescribed Vicodin by a, uh, by a back specialist doctor. He prescribed me uh, about 30 Vicodin pills, and um, when I took them, I fell in love with them right away. And uh, what I did was I went back to that doctor within about two weeks or so, and I conned him into getting me about 300 Vicodins, pretty much on my way into, into becoming an addict. I had broken my hand and I was prescribed Loratad. That was the, that was like the first time I actually started abusing them. Uh, I played, I played off my story uh, worse than it really was. I pretty much told him that it was, I was in such, such excruciating pain that I couldn't even, I couldn't even uh, walk, which was not true. I was bound, I was, going leaps and bounds everywhere I went. I just wanted to get and catch that high again. I would steal them from my brother, and I would steal his Concerta and his Ritalin, because it was like, I researched it, and I found out, oh, you can get high off this. And so I, of course, being a fiend, <laughs> I wanted to get high off whatever, and so I found out I could. Um, Mostly I would say that they get them from friends and usually it's from taking them from somebody's medicine cabinet. And there's also, they're readily available on the streets. Kids have access to their own money now more freely than they have in the past. It's very easy. It's easier to get illicit drugs than to get alcohol, you know, because you have to find someone to go in the store and do that. And that's more difficult than it used to be. Feeling like I never fit in not having too many friends growing up, so pretty much being an isolator and being alone. I was never really around too many people. I didn't have much self-worth or self-confidence. Uh, and drugs drugs were, were my solution, my problem. They pretty much solved everything. I didn't have to worry about friends. I didn't have to worry about family. I pretty much had me and me feeling the way I wanted to feel, which was high all the time. These medications are incredibly lethal when used in the incorrect fashion. Um, these are pharmaceutical grade substances that are really designed to be used in a very precise way under professional guidance. If the body is not used to encountering these medications, when they're taken even just one time, you can stop breathing and die, and die quickly. 
Once you stop breathing, you have approximately three to five minutes until all brain function shuts down. So there's almost no room for error. In particular, combining these medications with other things like marijuana or alcohol, the margin for error is very, very slim. Some of the really uh, big drugs that are being abused by our youth right now, Adderall for one, which is like a, a major upper. Um, and then there's major uh, downers that are being used, slowing respiratory like uh, Valium, Xanax. And these are very easy to find amongst our friends who have real clinical diagnos uh, diagnosis and are prescribed these medications. Seizures are very often a consequence of using uh, these benzodiazepines, these downers, because it slows brain activity. And then once they get off of them, seizures occur because it speeds up. So Oxycontin does seem to be a commonly abused medication. It's the long-acting form of oxycodone. It's manufactured by Purdue. Um, it's, it's highly associated with um, drug abuse in the community. It has a very high street value, um, such that our clinic actually does not prescribe any Oxycontin. Um, where most physicians are unclear why it's so highly abused. Um, it's typically altered from its typical form. A uh, number of drug abusers will crush it up and either snort it or inject it. Um, it seems to be associated with a strong rush or euphoria, and that may be related to why it's so commonly abused. You know, teenagers have anxiety. They want to come down. Oxycontin provides that. It, it shuts off the brain. You don't have to think about how you're not fitting in, you don't have the right clothes, you're a little overweight, you're not as fast as Joe, or maybe you were the best runner in school last year, this year you're not. You know, there's a lot of pressure on kids. There's a lot of pressure on kids in sports to succeed, you know, the steroids, all those things. My friends were also using at the same time. They didn't use to the extreme that I did. I tried to hide it, but uh, with drinking, smoking weed, and uh, and a, a slew of other drugs, it was pretty easy for me to hide my drug abuse and, until some of them started seeing that I wasn't hanging around them as much, that I was actually not caring enough, that I was smoking Oxycontin in front of them, not thinking that they would care. So when they stopped talking to me and stopped wanting to be around me, that was pretty much when they started noticing I had a problem too. Uh, I was able to snort them, smoke them, I would lace marijuana with those. Um, prescription drugs are deemed uh, by most people who abuse them as safer. They inherently believe that just because it wasn't supposedly cooked up in a, someone's garage that they are somehow safer to use. Did your family know you had a problem? I, th I think my mom like deep down knew I had a problem. Like she knew I was on something else besides weed because she knew what I looked like and how I acted when I was high on uh, marijuana. But the way I acted when I was high on pills was completely different. She knew I was high, but she didn't know what I was high on. My mom was there for the whole entire thing. She saw me day in and day out in my struggles. So when she, when she stopped uh, taking care of me, giving me a place to live at night, giving me food to eat, giving me money to have, uh, and that that didn't matter at the time, you know. When she kicked me out, you know that I just adjusted to life as it was. You know, I didn't care if I was on the streets, you know, stealing from stealing from places that I worked at, stealing from uh, drug dealers, whatever. It didn't matter. But then when when all that stuff finally started running out, when I couldn't steal anymore, and um, and she even had enough had enough of me and didn't want me to come back, even though it had been a couple months or something like that. It was. Uh, the only help that she would give me was sending me to a program, and that was enough for me to start thinking a little bit more about what I had been doing this whole time, when she completely cut me off. It's, it's not fun to see. It's very painful for the parents and anybody involved in their lives, but you need that. And there's so much pressure on kids now. You know, They have to think about college in second grade now. I mean, they're doing all these things and all this pressure, so it doesn't, you know, it doesn't surprise me that there's a lot more prescription drug, drug abuse. Feeling like I never fit in, not having too many friends growing up, so pretty much being an isolator and being alone. I was never really around too many people. I didn't have much self-worth or self-confidence. Uh, and drugs drugs were, were my solution, my problem. They pretty much solved everything. I didn't have to worry about friends. I didn't have to worry about family. I pretty much had me and 
me feeling the way I wanted to feel, which was high all the time. When I went to rehab at the age of uh, 18, my parents sent me off to rehab because I started going increasingly up in, in the drugs that I was using. I went from uh, Vicodin to Norco and finally to Oxycontin. Uh, when I got caught multiple times smoking Oxycontin on tinfoil by my, by my mom and her having enough on it, not knowing that I had been stealing money from her, not knowing that I was uh, dealing drugs, not knowing any of this. Um, when she finally found out, it was enough for her to, to try and get me some help and send me off to rehab. I first started coming to rehab through uh, a probation department. I, I had gotten caught up for some stupid stuff uh, that was so some felonies and some uh, misdemeanors. I was basically living in the moment and not thinking of consequences like many addicts do. I've been to seven programs, um, seven different rehabs by the time I'm 22, you know, so it didn't take very long for me to keep on going back to rehabs after rehabs because uh, after the first one I didn't think I had a problem. People who use drugs like meth, people who drank too much were uh, different than me. They were crazier than me, even though I was the one smoking pills off of tin foil. You know, it, it was, it, it, that, that's, how, that's how delusional I can get, uh, where I think that I don't have a problem, but everybody else in the world does. Many people struggle in rehab for many different reasons. I mean, there's no doubt it's a very uncomfortable or unpleasant sensation to go from high doses of opioid or narcotic medications to no medication. And what happens is typically when people are taking lots of drug, opioid drugs, whether it's heroin or, or oxycodone, essentially that medication is, is beating down our nerves. It's essentially coating all our nerves and the body responds by growing more of those nerves. And when you pull all that medication away, all of our nerves start to scream out at us. And it's like the body is dumping out lot of, uh, lots and lots of adrenaline. So the person feels that sensation as lots of anxiety and uncomfortable sensations. And so if it's, if it's done in a monitored setting with the right kinds of medications that treat those withdrawal symptoms, it can be tolerable. But for someone to just stay at home or have to go through that in a dark jail cell, um, it's unpleasant. And so some people will choose to continue on a path of addiction rather than to face that on their own initially. The problem is, is that our youth have a Superman complex. They believe that nothing can hurt them, or if it does hurt them and they survive it, that the next drug of choice is survivable as well. They're young, the feeling of invincibility. They're strong, they can do a lot. And they, you know, and if they're, you know, successful, which a lot of addicts are, they're highly intelligent, they're resourceful, you have to be resourceful to continue doing this with so much supervision nowadays and you know parents have a, an idea of where you are at all times you have to be resourceful and they're very intelligent it's a matter of turning that intelligence into something that helps their lives years back the only t amount of time that i had was about three months clean and um what led up to my relapses was me trying to hang out with my old friends who were still using me knowing they were still using but still trying to be friends with them even though they, a lot of friends didn't want me to stay sober, they didn't think I could stay sober, so they would call me telling me how high they were that day when I'm, when I'm struggling to try and stay clean myself. They would call me and let me know how high they were, and it, and it, was, it was pretty, uh, it hurt, you know, because I'm, I'm trying to get my life together, but they're still calling me, letting me know what they're doing. And so eventually, um, eventually I started going back going back to my hometown, started just thinking that I could be around people who were smoking weed. Uh, it eventually led me to still being around people who were shooting up drugs just like I used to, you know, because uh, that, that's ev eventually where it went to. I started shooting up Oxycontin, uh, morphine, Dilaudid, and then eventually led to heroin, because it doesn't stop at prescription pills, it starts going gradually, gradually worse. Um, and uh, I eventually me just being around those people that's what led led to my downfall again because I didn't cut them out of my life 
I thought because I had a friend that I've known my whole entire life that I could still be friends with him even though he was still using and I and I just thought that it was okay but that that's eventually what led to it but if I wouldn't have put myself in that situation I would not have gotten high it, it was me who put myself in that situation I can't blame it on him I can't blame it on anybody else I should have had the better common sense to not even be around them because if I if I didn't then I, I wouldn't have gotten high the person that's influenced me most to get clean and sober has got to be myself honestly like you got to do it for yourself because if you can't do it for yourself then you, you can't do it for anybody counseling um, having friends who are also sober uh, I know that's that that's a part of what goes into a 12-step program but being around people who are uh, positive, positively trying to change their life just like I am. Uh, grouping together and being there for each other, being a support group, that's what has also uh, uh, contributed into me uh, wanting to be sober. Being around young people who are sober the same age as me when I thought it was impossible to get sober at my age. Uh, being around them, that's, that, it, it gives me hope, you know. It gives me hope to want to stay sober. I, I do see a, a major change uh, because I don't have to lie anymore. There's nothing to lie about. When I take away those things, the quality of life is obviously going to go up because I'm not killing myself anymore. I have a great relationship with my brother now. Uh, I can talk to him, where, whereas before I was unable to even communicate with him without fighting him. My life's dramatically changed after stopping using drugs. I mean, I can hold a job. I can uh, be there for my family. Or that if you're having trouble, you can go talk to a friend. You don't have to talk to an adult. You can talk to someone in recovery. It's definitely connection with people, honesty, and presence. There's nothing I can do about my past. Um, I, I've given up all hope of having a better past. All I can do is try and make a better future. You guys just gotta open up a little. Just take that chance. Take the chance that you're not gonna get in trouble. You know, and you may get in trouble, but that trouble may be the, the um, catalyst to freedom from whatever you're involved in. It, it, it's, pre it's pretty amazing how, how, how much my life's changed just because I stopped using drugs. If you haven't hit your bottom yet, you're going to, you know. And it's, the bottom is the scariest part, but it gets better from the bottom.